right. Let's all give Eric a warm welcome. All right, uh, my name is Eric Webb. I'm a consultant at Acquia. I actually live in Atlanta and spent the weekend in Orlando. So I've been all over the place in the last four days. Um, not, not too bad of states to spend a uh, February in though, so I can't complain too much. Um, so Drupal design patterns, um, essentially I'm looking at that as a developer. So in the actual computer science term, not the theming graphical term. Um, a little bit about my background. I've been working with Drupal for about th a little over three years. I've been dealing with PHP for probably 10 plus. <coughs> I've been a system in for six years or so. Um, so an example of the design patterns I want to talk about are how do you use your own hooks. So for this is definitely geared towards the intermediate and above programmers. So it'll help to have an idea of scheme API or menu API, at least some general idea of how those work. Um, using static variables, uh, using Drupal's cache, not just installing memcache and configuring it, but actually developing for it. Storing objects in the database, uh, really doing it the easy way, not forcing it. Um, and also some little tricks of the menu system. All this is coming out of, I travel every week all across the country dealing with clients, and these are a lot of the things I don't see developers do that I can guarantee would make their code faster, more maintainable, um, just little tips and tricks here, so it's kind of a collection of tools. Um, so for the big CS people out there, these aren't design patterns like passive observers and singletons and all the real computer science scholarly stuff. Uh, these are very specific to Drupal. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is using your own hooks. Everyone knows what a hook is generally, right? It's the place in Drupal to hook in and um, sort of intercept and react to something Drupal's doing. Um, so there's a couple different hook types that sort of I define and I look at. Uh, there's actions, so when a node is saved, when a comment is saved, you can react to that. Aggregate, so collecting a lot of data together. Um, you can think of the way like, features will work, where it can take a whole bunch of information in different modules and just put it all together. Is this like um, module info versus Drupal alter? Or yeah, I'll show okay. examples. Cool. Um, so alter hook, so passing a single variable through all the all your modules to make changes to it, and also attributes. So things like uh, the views API. There's a hook to tell it what API you're using. Just different information that kind of defines what your module is. So there's four different ways to use hooks, and I'll run through a quick example of each one. Uh, there's simple invoking, uh, aggregating results, um, altering data, and passing by reference. That's actually a special case I'll explain in just a minute. So this is the simplest example. Uh, this just calls a particular hook on all your modules. You just kind of hand the keys of the car off and someone else runs with it. So you call this and you, know, you don't really have much control after that. Um, aggregating results, this is if each hook is actually returning something. You want to put all those together. Um, essentially, you get a list of all the modules that need to be called, and then you just throw all those in an array. Um, altering data. This is actually the easiest example. Any variable you have, the Drupal alter function is actually just a big wrapper around calling hooks, and it'll just call a hook and pass data through it. So. This is a really easy way that if you have a module that has some sort of data structure that you want other modules to be able to play off of, this is all it takes. It's very, very easy. And this is a great example of something that you could just put in there and maybe no one ever use, but you never have to go back and revisit it. And the passing by reference is similar to the alter. Um, the key thing here is the normal Drupal hook system won't pass by reference. So once you pass a variable in there, it's done. It just clones. Um, yeah, uh, so you basically have to give it a dynamic name and call it that way. Uh, but this is just a way, if you have to have multiple variables passed through and changed, this is just a workaround. What about that, like, underscore, underscore, Drupal, alter by ref thing? 
Seven, maybe. Six or seven? It's it some like six hack or something. Oh, well, it has a to do well. removing <laughs> Drupal 7. <laughs> that could but be one I've never seen. Apparently, you can do something by reference there, yeah. maybe. Well, Drupal alters by reference. This is more if you have some special like set of arguments or multiple things by reference. or This is a much more general oh, okay. case. Yeah, I think that's what it is. So I'm rushing through this a little. Um, at the end, I have a URL where I have all these documented, the slides, more explanations. So you can go in after the presentation and sort of fill in the missing pieces. Doing good. Hey, Eric, can you be sure to speak into your computer's mic? Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so another tip I don't see a lot of people using is actually using static variables properly, or at all, really. Um, so static variables are not Drupal specific in any way. Uh, it's a PHP feature and a feature of any programming language has scopes. Until seven. Well, I have examples of all of this. Um, so this is for preventing duplicate work within a request. So if you have something you do over and over that's specific to the request you're on and you, you want to save that, that's where static variables are from. Um, we'll talk about caching, which will be the opposite of that. And this is mainly for functions that are called all the time. So a quantity, a very often called function. So the PHP method is pretty straightforward. Um, you could probably copy this and paste this in pretty much any C-based language and it'll still work. The Drupal 7 version actually centralizes that. So you actually use the Drupal static function, which puts it all in one place. And the benefit of this is any function can actually reset that static variable, which is not something that's possible with the normal way. Oh, like cross-function, you can reset other functions. So the best example is if you do like a node save, it has a static variable that lists all those nodes. Calling this will reset that so you get the latest so update. You don't have to do node load null false or whatever anymore. No, this takes care of it. Cool. So we're going to look at using Drupal's cache. Again, as a developer, not just clicking that button that drives you crazy. Uh, what button is that? <laughs> the clear cache. Yeah. <laughs> uh, or slash all caches. So the caching system, this is for duplicate work between requests. So in other words, if it's not specific to the current user, the current URL, the current time, something that will actually persist, uh, that's what the caching system's for. Um, this is mainly for functions that take a long time versus something that's called often. Uh, and the great thing about this is you write some simple code and then depending on whatever the end user is doing, they can either use the core database system or memcache or APC or all those other performance tools and you don't have to do anything to get that ability. And another big thing a lot of people forget and uh, core actually has a problem with the form cache that needs to be worked on, um, but you shouldn't put anything in the cache that you can't regenerate and not lose anything. So the way cache expiration works is there's three different types. There's cache permanent, which means you have to clear it specifically by that individual key. So this is basically uh, something that will never change unless a specific action occurs. There's also temporary. So this is what's actually cleared when you do a clear cache all. Um, this actually is just basically whenever that happens. And the third case is if you want some specific time. And this is handled automatically. So all you have to do is give it that timestamp and it'll automatically expire for you. So a lot of um, Drupal's internals you'll see, like the page cache, it gives you amount of time to store a page. And that's how it does that. It doesn't do any magic cron or anything. Um, so here's a, basically the example. It's not really a more complicated example. Uh, essentially, you try to get it from the cache, and then you check and see if it was there. And if it's not, you make it and save it back to the cache. Again, this is one of the easiest things you can do to really pep up the speed of your module. And it li literally takes four lines of code wrapping around what you're already doing. So this is another one of those no-brainers. You might as well put that in there. 
So a little more advanced version of that is if you want to create your own cache, if for whatever reason you want to manage yours separately. Um, there's a nice little function. A lot I've seen a lot of people do this and copy and paste table definitions. Um, essentially, you just want to copy the core cache table and use all those same columns. Um, so you have to make sure you create the table. And the second part here, using hook flush caches, I see so many people forget, and then their cache never clears. So if you use your own table and you don't put this in, you're going to drive yourself really, really nuts because your cache will never, ever go away. Um, so this is what's called by clear cache all. The, uh, for the schema array that I see you're building up there in the schema hook, yeah. um, is there any kind of prefix, cache underscore, like is that special or was that just a name you gave it? No, that's, so whenever you're calling it, you have to put in the full table name. Yeah. So you could call it whatever you want, but just cache underscore whatever your name is. Okay. Um, there's no sort of like set guideline, but just semantics. Just for clarity, you prefix it with cache underscore and then... Yeah. Okay. That way, if when you're like doing database exports, you can just get rid of all your cache tables and know exactly which ones they are. Um, so storing objects in the database, people that don't come from a Drupal background or they're new to Drupal, I see a lot of people create an object, take out individual fields, save those to the database one by one, uh, but it's really not that hard. People, this is definitely something people tend to overthink. So there's two different ways of saving objects that I'll talk about. Um, the first one is Drupal Write Record, which is the easiest way. This is if you want to save an entire object back to the database field by field. Uh, this is primarily for just simple inserts and updates. Essentially, you pull an object out of the database, you make some changes, you put it right back in. And the nice thing about this is using, not to get too far into it, but in Drupal 7, the new database API, you can actually set it to automatically bring back objects, or you can pull objects in Drupal 6. And essentially, this is a quick way to pull out an object and automatically have the format to go right back into the database. Why, why would you want to save your objects in the database? Well, this is if you have a row of a table or record, then you can change one column and save it back without writing any SQL. So like in this case, um, so this is a quick example scheme I have. Uh, all it is is an ID and value. It's nothing special. Um, so like in this case, um, essentially you create the object. You could replace this with loading an object from the database though. Uh, and then essentially you decide if you want to do an insert or update and then you write the record back to the database to a specific table. So you don't have to worry about what fields are in there. You don't have to worry about the actual SQL at all. Uh, Drupal write record will take care of all that. And one really nice thing is if you do an insert, it'll actually populate that ID field for you. So you don't have to go in searching for it and pulling that from the database. And Drupal write record isn't limited to node objects. It's any PHP object that you want to make. Yeah, any object. So essentially all the fields of the object have to map to columns of your table. Could try to get next to it. Yeah. Cut me out one time. Yeah, it has Somehow. to be exactly. Drupal record, Drupal write record checks all your schema. Yeah, my schema didn't get loaded once. And I had to then install schema manually. That was really weird. Yeah. So there's another way to deal with objects in the database. The first one is if you have a whole record that maps. Uh, this one is if you want to save an entire object to somewhere in your database. So in our case here, uh, this is automatically done by Scheme API. So the best example of this is, uh, like if you look at the user table, there's that, I think it's options or data or something, that last column just has a whole bunch of extra stuff in it. Uh, this basically allows you to add arbitrary arrays or objects to your database without adding columns and yeah are, are you suggesting this is a good method i mean you're, you're spending a, a lot of cases. time on this and i i just by far one of my biggest pet peeves and the fact that 
pupil has really horrible normalization. So I, I'm not saying it's yeah. not sometimes good, but well, this is. I mean, this is definitely best restricted to, like, yeah. the user object where you have some random attributes that may be added to it and may not be. So this is easier than having, you know, 10 more columns and having one filled in at a time. So you can never so sort by this. You can never search by this. This is just kind of extra little metadata that goes in there. So it's, it's definitely not something you use all the time, but especially when you have other modules affecting your object and you don't want them adding columns to your tables, this is a good workaround Basically, for that. Basically, if you never manipulate that data again, it makes sense. But if you're going to manipulate... If you never manipulate in SQL. Yeah. 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 I, mean, like I used it once for to store a user key for a third-party API, so right. for single sign-on. So that, like, what's the point of that in updating a column every time to that? I, I, I just wanted to draw attention to... There's definitely use cases for this, but yeah. definitely times where you, could, you you cause a lot of trouble in scalability. So the nice thing about this method for its use case is since in the schema, you just tell it to serialize whatever goes in there. And whenever you save an array or some kind of PHP object, it'll automatically flatten it essentially. Um, make in the text and put that in the database. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's just a nice method of having some sort of extra options for an object. Um, so these are just a collection of a couple of menu tricks um, that I don't see many people using. So page arguments is an easy one. Uh, most people know how to use this. Uh, the biggest thing is it allows you to reuse the same callback for multiple pages. Uh, a lot of times I see people have one menu callback for every menu item, and then they reroute it underneath that. Um, you have to remember that the URLs are zero-based, so don't start counting one, two, three, four. Um, and I see way too many people use arg in their callbacks, which the menu already knows what all those arguments are, so all of a sudden you start looking at the callbacks and seeing random arg ones and twos and threes and you kind of lose the context once you're outside of the menu. So it, it just makes for kind of sloppy code. But like arg, arg in your hook init is okay then if you're checking what, yeah. path, what path you're at. Yeah, because that's generic to any menu. Um, so title callbacks... By default, you have the T function, which for most cases is fine. Um, but for instance, if you have some sort of data structure like nodes or users, and the title needs to be completely different than, or it needs to be dynamic, uh, you can overwrite the title callback and manipulate the title however you want. And this is another one I see way too often is using Drupal set title. Again, it's just something that it doesn't make sense within the body of a module um, to see that. Maybe in the theme, but it just it doesn't semantically make sense for a module that should be doing work to be changing the structure of the page. And this one I'm not sure I've ever seen anyone use. Um, load functions. So and all I those use them as a user, but I haven't I haven't written one. So all those URL arguments, those percent signs, those are actually automatically sent to a function so you can load whatever is in the URL. These are executed before all other callbacks. So we'll see in the example where that makes the most sense. And this is sort of the key most people don't notice is essentially whatever you put in the URL, it just adds load to it and that's the function name. So it's not a hook, it's not really documented anywhere, but that's just how it works. That's pretty funny. Um, and, like, what's this percent node? How do we do this? And this is another great way to remove redundant code. So a lot of times people have the first line and all their callbacks will take an argument and load it out of the database. You just you always see that. Most contrib modules do it that way too. 
So here's an example to kind of tie all that together. So at the top, I have a simple menu item. Uh, you can see the second one is the argument because it has that percent sign. So what that's actually going to do is call my module data load immediately when the menu act, when the menu's loaded. So what that does is it comes down here and it sends whatever that URL argument is. And you can return the object form of that argument. And now all the other callbacks that are on that page receive the object instead of having to load from that uh, from the ID or whatever's in the URL every time. So this is exactly how node works, user, taxonomy, all those taxonomy slash numbers and node slash numbers, they all do this. Um, it's really easy to use, but again, it's just not really documented anywhere. Um, and then in this third example, this is the page callback. So the argument that gives in there is actually the object. So you can use this all over the place for different data structures. Like you said, you can take advantage of node or user that's already out there. Um, but this is what it's doing behind the scenes. So putting all that together, um, actually every single bit of that, I have an example here of using sort of the old way of doing exportables, which I still kind of prefer. Um, so essentially on this page, I have our menu options. Uh, the top is very simple, simple callback, nothing special. The second's gonna make use of our load functions and arguments. The third is a empty tab. And the fourth one will use our, uh, will again use our load function and actually export the data object so you can copy and paste that somewhere else. So this is where we're using our static and aggregate hooks. Uh, so essentially, this is how we're going to pull everything from the database and everything from code and jam it all together. Sorry, I just noticed on your left side you had arg instead of array for the page arguments. What, what's oh, the difference? That's a typo. It's a typo. Yeah. Can you repeat the question? Um, so in this example, I have arg1 in the menu items, and that's just a, I guess not quite a typo, but it should be array, not arg. So I'll fix that. No one caught that in Orlando, so. Welcome to Los Angeles. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is our function that basically pulls all of our data together, whether it's in the database or in code. Um, so basically, this is obviously a Drupal 7 example, um, but I'm going to pull everything from the database and then everything from the code and put it all together. I can't do this exactly in the first example where you're just adding it to an array because I'm actually combining arrays. Uh, but in this case, uh, a nice little trick is using array merge. This is how its core features will let the database overwrite code, is just the order of these arguments. Um, so in this example, this would be the database always taking precedence over code. But because we have our static wrapped around this, we can call this 100 times on a page and it's only going to do the real guts of the function once. So in our top example, this is our load function that we, that we saw in the menu items. So all we had is adding underscore load, and it calls this. And I'm going to call that function I just showed you that pulls everything from the database and the code. And again, because it's static, once it's called here at the beginning of the page, I can call it as much as I want later on, and it doesn't matter. You can call it as much as you want, and it'll execute just as fast as the first time. Uh, here's my custom title callback. So because I don't actually know the title of any particular page, I can pull out something from that data structure into the title. So in the case here, I'm just pulling out the value field. And at the bottom here, we have our two page callbacks. And because we already have the objects, we don't have to do that work multiple times. It's already done for us. So if all we want to do is view it, it, just one line, return a theme function, you're done with the display. Or in our case of exporting, 
uh, we can just return the exported version of that object. So this is the load functions are definitely one that I think I'd like to preach more and don't see enough of because it really simplifies everything you're trying to do. So there's a lot more tricks and design patterns Drupal uses. Uh, locking mechanisms is one. This is another one where there's actually a little bug in Drupal 7. Um, queuing and batching. Queuing's new to Drupal 7. Batching isn't. So essentially queuing allows you to put in a whole bunch of operations that have to happen and those can just be run slowly over time. Uh, batching is putting all those together and running at once. Uh, theme fallbacks and suggestions. This is actually brand new in Drupal 7 and they talk about it in that Drupal 7 book. And this essentially allows you to have uh, multiple levels of fallbacks for your themes. So the easiest example is there's a menu hook or a menu theme function in Drupal 6 and everywhere before it. Now you can call it menu underscore underscore main menu and you can actually check and see if there's a main menu theme function or a main or a menu function and it can actually do multiple levels. So when you're writing your theme functions now you can be as specific as possible and then fall back on whatever's less specific. So registry alters are scary and I don't necessarily advise you to use them but um, Drupal 7 allows you to do even more with that with the uh, theme registry especially and hopefully in Drupal 8 we'll have a hook registry to play with too. And renderable arrays, this is definitely not any sort of design pattern, but I definitely want to mention here just in terms of this is a completely new way that Drupal handles the, the theme system. Uh, so basically the big thing to know here is whatever you have in your Drupal 6 theme printing out like the content variable, uh, that whole paradigm Drupal 7 is different. Uh, so just one more thing to keep in mind going forward. So I just started with Drupal probably day in, day out, maybe a little more than a year ago. So these are just sort of the ways I learned these tricks and I actually got moving. Reading core issues is a great way to learn about this, like the where do the load functions come from. This isn't just reading the patches or reading core code, but if you actually read the issues, you can find out a lot about why something was created that way or the actual <laughs> thought process behind it. So this is definitely a really underutilized resource. Looking through common functions, in the open source world, these are the functions that are called most often. So they have the most eyeballs on them, they probably have the most performance tweaks, and they probably also have the best practices applied to them. So looking at node load, user load, all the things that are most common to Drupal is a great way to pick up these patterns. Uh, if you want to spend a good weekend going through one run of Drupal, um, stack trace and debuggers will tell you everything about what Drupal is doing internally, but it'll probably drive you crazy at the same time because so much is going on. Yeah, especially um, Drupal get formed. Yeah. It what? drives me crazy. It's like, wait, was it Drupal build or retrieve where it actually calls the form function? Yeah, so, but this is a great way of actually knowing what all those do and more importantly, what actually gets called when. With all the magic functions in Drupal, it's kind of hard to figure that out sometimes. Uh, like any good developer, you memorize api.drupal.org. I mean, everyone's done that already, so no need to discuss that. Um, this is a big one that I see way too much of is just because you don't have the solution to it easily doesn't mean you should install a full module to get that little bit of functionality. Um, I see sites with 150 plus modules because they needed little bits and pieces of all these different modules. Mm -hmm. It's not to say to reinvent the wheel and always go out on your own and redo it, but sometimes it's better to just take out part of a module or rewrite a little piece of that so you don't have all that extra cruft on your site. Um, there's actually a great blog post mm -hmm. I think Krell did recently about using Drupal as an API. Um, and you have to remember Drupal is a framework it's not just a CMS. So all these functions actually make Drupal easy to program and develop for, not just 
add new node types and content and all that. So it's important to know that Drupal has a extensible enough API that you should look to that first instead of trying to write raw PHP to do it for you. A big thing is spending time on flexibility, not complexity. So this goes back to, for instance, using Drupal Alter. Um, this allows any module to come in after the fact and just use whatever you've made available to them. Um, but more importantly, uh, you know, if you're going to write hooks and you're going to write code that other people can use, use that yourself. So Views does a great job of this. Uh, you know, if, if you have some sort of default hook you use, implement it yourself so you know if it works and you know what's actually going to happen instead of doing your work and then calling everyone else's hooks. This just gives you a more predictable way of understanding what's going on. So I definitely flew through those code examples. Um, I have all of those examples and more explanations on my blog, fuscoairclub.net. It's like the first six or seven posts. They're actually all broken out by topic. Um, so you can find me on Twitter at, at Eric Webb if you have any questions about it, or I don't mind, if, even if you have any Drupal questions at all, feel free to reach out to me. <coughs> Does anyone have any questions about that or uh, about the presentation or maybe more directions, uh, things you've run into? This isn't a question really, but I, I'm, I, I just want to tell you I'm excited to find out to investigate the load function a bit more and learn about that. I, I feel like you were burning my face off a little bit here. <laughs> so, in, in a good way. Yeah, yeah, I'm definitely, I'm definitely doing the loaded at beginning of every function thing. Yeah, that's definitely one of the goodies. That it's not a hook, so it's not documented. And if you look and see in the menu system, literally all it does is say, call that argument name underscore load, and then it calls a dynamic function name. So there's no documentation or anything. You just have to, you kind of just have to know it's there, unfortunately. Would you recommend people check out projects like the Examples Project uh, to yeah. see how a lot of these features are done? Yeah, absolutely. Especially, that's actually where I always copy and paste every time I have to do something in Batch. Because I never remember what Batch looks like, but they have really super simple examples. Um, especially in Drupal 7 is, because so much of the underlying API is different, Examples fully embraces that and actually shows really good examples too. A lot of contrib modules aren't exactly perfectly written, but examples is purposefully written to be really easy to read, commenting and all that. Right. And for those that don't know, what we're actually talking about is a project on Drupal.org called Examples, and it's literally just a whole chunk of modules of every type of API piece that you'll end up learning. Like you mentioned, the Batch API, uh, you know, the Q API, Form API, uh, AHA Ajax, all all those pieces, I mean, basically, you could take that Drupal 7 book right there, thank you, Paul, uh, download and install Drupal yourself, but then add the examples module suite, and you would have exactly what you need to really get going and actually produce complex or simple modules, whatever you really need to do. So. And to add on top of that, there's actually a views examples module. Oh, sweet. Which <laughs> I'm kind of scared to even say, but for some reason, it's a completely <laughs> different module. Yeah. But it serves the same purpose. Wonderful. So that's at drupal.org slash project slash examples. examples. Yes. All right. Are there any remaining questions? Let's give a round of applause. Thank you.